Anxiety symptoms in young people have doubled. For the second time this week, there have been explosions in Crimea. The prospect of tough local restrictions could bring more hardship again. two paths to go down, if I really simplify it. You can either go down a constructive or destructive path. And you have choices every day. Yes, you're going to fall. Yes, you're going to have issues. You're going to have people say, no, I'm not employing you. You're not good enough. You've got to dust yourself off and stand up and keep going. Because I promise you, eventually, you will get something that you can tangibly hold on to that gives you that feeling of hope. You don't have to get your entire career right based on the first step. In fact, my first job was stacking shelves for Sainsbury's. Good afternoon everyone, it's Jack Parsons, the UK's Chief Youth Officer and the CEO of the Youth Group. And today we've got another fantastic episode of My Duvet Flip. The thing that flips your duvet every morning. Some of you will be looking for your first time job, some of you will want to build your money powers, some of you will be just passing your driving test and we'll be talking about insurance in a minute. But today it's all about inspiration, hope an opportunity for you to go away and think about how can I make the next step? And to help me with that, I've got a really, really special guest today, a fantastic leader who has been through a lot in his life, uh, most recently, uh, overseas traveling to Australia, which we'll probably talk about sure. in a minute, John. But I'm gonna give the mic over to John to explain a little bit about what does he do currently? Jack, it's fantastic to be with you today. So, so I'm the CEO of Lloyds of London, which is an insurance marketplace. So would you believe it, a hundred different insurance companies, many the names of many of which people listening today and watching today would know, turn up at our building every day and 200 broking firms. So it's, it's a unique gathering of people in our industry. So within 300 meters of our front doorstep are 35,000 people working in the insurance industry. So wow. it's different, and we'll talk a bit more about it, I'm sure, as we get on. You, you, you say, along with the insurers, brokers. I just want to jump straight in that. What is mm. a broker? So, so what happens is, is that if you're someone that needs to buy insurance, that could be quite complex. You could be BP at one end of the spectrum, or you trying to buy insurance for your car, as you said. You need some advice, and you go to a broker. A broker is a specialist who looks after the customer's interest what type of insurance do you need? And then they, in understanding your needs, go and see an insurer and persuade an insurer to insure you and at the right price. So they're the intermediary, they're wow. the go-between. Wow, so it, it really is a marketplace. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a marketplace where people meet. So you know, in, in a world today when people convene rarely, people come into our building every day. So typically, there are six, seven, 8,000 people walking around our building, brokers, trying to connect with insurers to get the best deal for the client they're representing. So it's very physical and very real, almost unique. I don't know why, but every time I walk past a building, I just think of men in black for some reason. <laughs> I don't know why. So, so I think it's been in lots of movies, you know, hasn't it? Yes. So uh, I couldn't, you know, bear in mind Lloyd's has been around for well over 300 years. So when I was a youngster working in the Lloyd's market, I couldn't believe that these old guys had chosen that building. Really? Did they, ch did they pick this building? Did they know what they were doing when they decided on it? I'm glad they did, because everyone has a view about the building, don't they? So uh, Absolutely. it's different. But I want to go, I want to go, I want to start yep. on, and I always ask this question at the start, what was your first job? What did that job teach you? 
And what do you want to pass on for those who may be going into their first or second sure. job? Sure, great question. So, so, so I'd, uh, you'll love the story. So I sat my A-levels and I did English, French and Latin for A-level. So dad at home, who's in the army, is saying, so what are you going to do if you don't get your A-levels? And I go, well, and the plan's to get the A-levels. He sent me out for job interviews. So at 18, I got two letters on one day, which you don't get when you're 18, do you? One was my offer at university to read English and drama at Warwick. And the other was to train to be an accountant with ICI. So dad turned around and said, it's obvious what you should do, isn't it? So I went to ICI to train to be an accountant with English, French and Latin as A-levels. I think within a week of being there, I hated it. It's not what I wanted to be. And I thought, you know what, this is what work is like. You just got to knuckle down and you got this for the next 40 years of your life. Spent two years trained to be an accountant, the grounding of which did me lots of favours. But it took me two years to work out that's not what I wanted to do. And I left and responded to an advert in the paper that said trainee Lloyd's underwriter. And the rest is history. And I've loved it. I want to break some of that down. Go, so, go. Two letters. Yep. Option. Choice. Yep. Decisions. Yep. Can overwhelm you. How does a young person go about, and what's your advice for a young person who go to go about in terms of making a choice? So I think it cuts both ways. So, so I think where it's different to when I was a youngster is, is I think you've got to be a lot better prepared for that moment. You can't let that moment come at you because it's overwhelming. So I, I think there should be a lot more time and thought going into what should you do next. So if you're 15, 16, you don't need to do A-levels. If you're 17, 18, you don't have to go to university. Maybe that's the right answer, maybe it's the wrong answer. So I think you need lots of conversations. And I think for those of us that are a bit older, we've got a responsibility to put a lot of time into kids at that age. So my third eldest is 18, just at the stepping point of should she go to university. So I've spent a lot of time not just talking to her, talking to her friends um, and some of them about insurance, some, about some of the things you can do. So, so I think the best thing you can do if you're that age and the best thing you can do if my age is have the conversation. So just leave people feeling just a bit better informed about the choice. So when you have to make the choice, it's not a moment of panic where you think it's 50-50, I'll flick a coin, will I, make, will I make the right decision, will I make a bad decision? And for those young people who don't have a super dad at home, yeah. who do they speak to? What should they, how do they start the conversation? Who should they go to? So I, th I think they should do both things. So I think you, you, you're always going to talk to your mates, aren't you? But that gives you one view. I would hope that everybody, you know, if they've not got the, the mum and dad around, I hope they've got an adult and I would hope that if someone asks a question of an adult, they'd take the time out to sit down with someone that age and say, look, I can give you my view. And I think the more views you can get, and that doesn't change, it doesn't matter whether you're a teenager, it doesn't matter whether you're my age, advice is brilliant. It's the best thing you can have in life. So the more people you can ask, the more opinions you can get, the better equipped you are to make a good decision, in my view. And that never changes throughout your entire life. I love that, and I think that's so fundamental advice is brilliant get as much advice as you can take it in and then make the choice that you want to yeah, make. yeah absolutely and don't you know, in my job story you know off i go trained to be an accountant that was not what i should have done but but i think the the important thing there is to draw a line and say do you know what i've tried this it's not the right do something different you know we're not all going to make the right decision first time around i mean rarely are we going to make the right decision first time around so don't be frightened of making a mistake you know, and I still do that in the workplace. You know, I, I remind everybody that sits around me, you know, everyone that turns up to work with us, they turn up with the best intentions on a Monday morning. They do not turn up to get it wrong. So if someone makes a mistake, then sit down with them and try and understand why they made the decision they did and teach them as to why the decision could have been something different. My, my first ever boss in insurance used to say to me, I don't mind what decisions you make as long as you can explain to me why you made that decision and then we'll have a conversation. If I've got a different view, that's fine. If you make a decision and you cannot explain to me why you made that decision, we've got a problem. And that was quite a good way of learning. It is actually. good, isn't it? It's quite a good way of learning. So before you make the decision, think about why you're making it. Yep. And if it goes wrong, explain it. Yeah. And when we mean explain, don't blag. No, yeah. no. So, so you decided to give insurance to a particular business at a certain price, why? So you'd say, well, this is what I was going through. These are the thought processes. This is why I decided yes. And this is why I priced it this way. So someone might turn and say, well, actually, there's 22 reasons why you should have done that differently. That's learning, isn't it? And, and I, I still believe in that today. You know, that 
People do not turn up on a Monday morning to get it wrong. They turn up to get it right. So if someone gets it wrong, just take some time out and understand why they made the decision they did and help them make a different decision next time. That's my view. Do you know what my first job was? Go, go for it. My first job, my first opportunity was an apprenticeship in a small insurance broker called NetPig. And it was really wow. small. Where were they? They was in Romford. Wow. Yeah, and I think they was... Uh, is it Tower Gate, an insurer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, yeah. they yeah, were yeah. a kind of subcontractor of Tower Gate. Yeah, yeah. And I turned up. And I didn't know what I was getting involved with. But the fundamental lessons and the people around me and getting on... And I was at band calling. And my job was to go through a list of numbers and try and get people interested in to go through to the broker's team so they could quote them on the, uh, cool. on the quotes. And the, what I learned around communication, around how to use a computer properly, and just having a conversation. So they're the three things I learned. What do, you, what do you think are the things that young people learn? What did you learn getting into insurance? So, what can people expect? Yeah, so I, th I think a few things really. So, and I still, I still think, think the same way now. So just do your homework. In every situation, do your homework. I do it today. Whatever meeting I'm gonna have, take 15, 20 minutes out to think about what that meeting's about, what objectives you should try and achieve through the conversation you're gonna have and be really clear about the conversation you wanna have with the person you're talking to. So number one, do your homework. Number two, stick your hand up. You know, there's plenty of chances, plenty of opportunities. And number three, a bit like your broking job, I'd wanna meet the customer. So I really want to understand if someone's thinking about insurance, then I wanna meet the customer because and, and I'm, I'm an optimist by nature, so take this in the context it's meant. Nine out of ten people in life are like you and I. They're all pretty straightforward, they're all pretty decent, their intentions are good. So if you can have a conversation with somebody, then you've created a connection, you've created an opportunity for you and for them, and that's going to be positive. So, so the big thing, the, those will be the two big things. One, do your homework, and, and two, don't be frightened about putting your hand up. Y you won't get it wrong. Every situation you put yourself in, you'll learn something. Will you come? Will you come back with something every time? Maybe not, but you'll learn something. We had Theo from Dragons Den on. Wow! And he said, "Do your own work." And I was gonna, and I really regret it every time not asking him. How does someone do their own work? What's your tips? But we went on to talk about his mining, uh, and it went off. So I, this is a brilliant opportunity to ask you, a bit like Theo saying, "Do your own work. Turn up, and before you turn up, do your own work. What what you're getting involved with." What does it what does it practically mean so for me to go and do my own work so 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 different ways of doing it so you could be meeting a person a business or putting yourself in a situation so the chances are somebody else you know has been in a similar situation so go and talk to them this, this is this is what's coming up how would you deal with this situation so number one talk to someone number two the beauty of the world we live in today is there's so much information around look it up if you're seeing somebody or something, look them up. What's been written about them? What's happening recently? And then number three, be a bit, bit more social about it. Is there something that day that's happening that could relate to them or their business? So that's what I mean. And you know, you, you don't have to spend hours on it. Just 10 or 15 minutes, well worth doing. And by doing your homework, what, how would that, what would that do to the kind of outcome? How would so, that so I think it, makes the, it, it gives the outcome some purpose. So your head's in the right space. I'm going to this meeting and I'm really clear on what I'm doing. So that's the other thing you want to do is every time you've got a meeting or you're connecting with somebody, why? What are you there for? What do you think you should be getting out of that conversation, they should be getting out of that conversation? So go there with an objective. It could change during the conversation, but just, just give yourself a purpose. Homework, purpose, and then follow up. Mm. afterwards always follow up i agree you know, the power of today is in the follow-up absolutely so i would always do that so i always say look when i finish a meeting i, I kind of want 10 minutes because whilst it's all fresh in my mind what have i got to do is there a phone call i've got to make is there a note i've got to send to somebody have i got to connect them with somebody else follow up so in with a purpose out with a plan correct the power of today is in the follow-up and do your own work yeah tell me a little bit about putting your hand up because i love that because we sit in a room and every, you say, anyone got any other questions, any kind of AOB, any other, any other business? And then everyone sits quiet and no one wants to volunteer. What does it mean by putting your hand up? So, so I, think, I think there are opportunities that will present themselves to anybody that's listening in the workplace to go somewhere, to do something. It, 
So don't sit back, stick your hand up. If there's a chance to go to a meeting, if there's a chance to go to visit somebody to do something, then, then stick your hand up because that experience will teach you something. And it's all of those experiences that add up in life to create value. So for, for me, in my early days in insurance, I learned, as we were saying a moment ago, go see the customer. So have the conversation direct with them. What, are they, what do they need me to do? How can I help? You created a connection. And that learning you can apply again and again. And for me, you know, I had the opportunity to travel. We were talking about before we sat down. So, so I've worked here, I've worked in the US. I've worked and lived in Australia. And I think those are great things to do. Those are opportunities. And, and I, think, I think they make you a slightly different person. They make you a bit more thoughtful, a bit more empathetic, a bit more considered. And that's just because you put yourself in different situations and different circumstances. So you get a broader perspective as to what makes people tick. So I think the more opportunities you can create, the more connections, the better you are for it. So stick your hand up. If there's a chance to go somewhere, do something, say, can I go? Can I come? Can I help? Help me break down. So Rishi and the president of Google recently said to me, Jack, one skill for young people that they should d practice more, a soft skill, is be curious. Ask a question. And, and you have to be curious to travel. What does so you're saying be curious is asking the question. Yeah, ask a question. So I would say, I would say if someone ever asks, you know, if you're sat in a meeting, as you say, people sit in their hands, you think, anybody got any questions they want to ask? If someone asks a question, then my interpretation is they're interested. There's no such thing as a stupid question. There just isn't one. If you're asking a question, it's because you're interested. So help. So, so I think that, that's a, a good example of curiosity. But I think, um, I think if you can put yourself out there, a little bit, I think, I think you get respect, get valued. Most people are not trying to trip you up. Honestly, they're not. So if you put yourself in a situation and you're honest about it saying, look, I've not been in this circumstance before or I thought I'd come and talk to you about, then people will lean into you, it's, it is my experience. Talking about putting yourself out there, I totally agree. Get mm. yourself out there and uh, have that growth have moment. Look. Yeah, what, for those who are sitting there making their career choices right now going yeah but I'm not confident I don't have the encouragement how can someone build the confidence to thrive so I think you're right I mean people are different aren't they so so I think um, you're not number one if you're feeling that way you're not going to be judged you know when you sit in front of someone and it's a job interview they're not looking to judge you they're looking to get to know you so so be, be honest. So if you feel a bit nervous or a bit anxious, say you feel a bit nervous or a bit anxious. No one's going to judge you badly for that because everyone knows the situation you're in is harder for you than it is for the person talking to you. So if you feel that way, be honest about it and try and pull the conversation around to something that interests you because most people when they interview are trying to find out a bit more about you. So if you can get that conversation to you, then you'll connect and you'll create some value. But, but say, sometimes just say how you feel. And if you're feeling a bit nervous, a bit anxious, say you're feeling a bit nervous, a bit anxious. Well, have you ever been judged and what did you do when you was last judged? So I, th I, think I'm, I think in the role that I'm in, and, and I was, you know, when I was down in Australia, I was the CEO of a listed company, you're judged every minute of the day. You know, you, you know, every decision you make is judged and interpreted and commented on. I mean, you mentioned Rishi Sunak. Imagine, imagine the thought process he goes through. I think, I think you need, you know, through life to create some resilience. And, and resilience for me comes in a number of ways. You know, you, you need to work out where you feel comfortable. You know, is it your family? Is it your friends? Is it your pets? What makes you tick? What makes you feel most comfortable? And, and carry that with you. Because everyone, for different reasons, at different stages in life, just needs that bit of resilience. Because you've got to be you. Because you can't be anything else, can you? The moment you try and think, right, I want to be like Jack, it's not going to work, is it? Because I'm not, you know. Be so you, you've just got to be yourself. And, and I think you need to have the confidence to do that. So there is a bit of resilience in that. And resilience is your own personal comfort circle. What, what is that? Is it your friends? Is it your family? Is it uh, something Does that else? come with experience? I went into yeah. a room last night. Yeah. And... I, I only normally go into a room when I'm speaking because we're all busy and so I go when I'm on stage I'll speak and I'll, then I'll kind of exit out but 
last night I was in a room where I wasn't the speaker, I was just a guest, and I don't know why, but I just felt, and there was f some high senior people, and I don't mind speaking and falling over and stuff, but I just felt really insecure mm. and felt judged because I was probably the youngest person in the room. Yeah. Everyone was probably over the age of 80. And even when I went and approached someone to talk, I felt judged. How can, we, how can young people get out of that kind of thinking in the moment of feeling judged? Because I was thinking, oh, are they thinking, oh, what does he know? He's kind of thing. How do you, how do you so, re-engineer your brain to think? So, so I, th I think each moment probably has a different answer. Let me, let me give you a little story. You'll like this one. So I'm a young insurer and uh, I started life as a motor insurer. You talk about insuring your cars, but I used to insure the lorries and the buses. And um, I used to enjoy meeting the customers and, and used to sort of like talking, like you said. I like talking about their business. And I sat, I sat up just outside Leeds and this Hawley is just looking at me and I'm talking and talking and I'm not getting anything back. And I'm, so I'm thinking, right, just stop talking. And he looks at me and says, we're going outside. I'm thinking, he's gonna thump me. I've upset him. We've walked outside, we've walked across the yard. He's opened the door to a big lorry and said, get in and sit behind the wheel. So I've sat behind the wheel. He said, back this truck up. I said, I don't know how to start the engine. He said, you've just learned something today, haven't you? Why don't you concentrate on what you know and I'll concentrate on what I know. So really difficult moment. And I thought in the moment and said the best thing I could have said was, I have just learned something today, but can you do me a favor? And he said, what's that? I said, can you teach me how to back this track up? And he did, I backed the truck up. And then we created a connection and an opportunity came out of it. So even in those difficult moments, just, just, you know, just be brave around how your reaction is. And the reaction can be a simple one. So mine was, you're right, I'm wrong but show me how to do what you've just said I can't do. Isn't that empowering? Yeah, different. And different way of thinking it. It's just different. And, you know, um, we're, none of us are experts in everything, are we? Or, or maybe anything. So, so I think it's just that little bit of confidence, I would say, that, that whatever strikes you in the moment is probably going to be right. And give it a go. So you, you, made, you got these two letters. You went yeah. down the accountancy yes. route. You made a mistake. Help. Did, did you just think to yourself, I've really muffed this up the, these last two years. What a waste of time. No, I believe nothing no, in life is a waste no, of time. No. How did you kind of, I know we're using this a word a lot in the press at the moment, but bounce back and go, actually made a mistake, learned from it, moved on. Because a lot of young people, they'll go into a job, yeah. they'll last three months, yeah. they won't pass their probation, yeah. and then they'll say, work's not for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so for me, um, I went through quite a, I mean, literally, as I, as I said, within a week, I thought, I'm not entirely sure this is for me. But what I did understand was that the process I was going through was not a bad thing. You know, is it good to be numerate? Is it good to be able to add up and count? Yes, yes, yes. So, so I sort of knew that, that, that I was getting value out of what I was doing. I just didn't feel that it was playing to my strengths. I didn't really know what my strengths were. And I'll tell you what happened. I was playing a bit of squash in those days and I played with the sales director. I said, I do all these reports for you every month. Are they useful? He went, I just throw them in the bin. So again, thinking on your feet, I said, well, are there reports I could do for you that would be valuable? He said, well, yeah, actually, because ICI dealt with itself. You tell me who we're dealing with, tell me what myself. I said, I can do all of this. So he said, great. So I did them. He said, fantastic. Come to the sales meeting. I want you to present. I thought, God, I'm getting value here. Chief account accountant calls me in. I'm thinking, I'm going to get a pay rise. Well, what are you doing? Uh, well, <laughs> I had this conversation. I showed some initiative. That's not what I asked you to do. Go back to doing what I want you to do. And I remember going home that night. I was engaged to be married, thinking this is not the job I want to be in. I resigned the next day. And it was that conversation that made me do probably what I'd been thinking for a while. I was, it wasn't the brightest thing I'd ever done. I hadn't got another job to go to. So there was mild panic then thinking, what am I going to do? And that's when I found myself in insurance. But, but the one thing you should know, and everyone should know, is there's no bad decisions in life. You know, a decision is a decision. It's a good thing to do. 
So if you really, really don't feel comfortable, it, it's probably the brave thing to do, but make a change. Make a change. Because you're you, you've got to where you've got to for all the good reasons. Try something different. And that is the first 20 minutes. We're gonna take a quick break and we're gonna come back in a moment. Isn't this so inspiring? I've got so much going through my head, but a lot of it is about going from having all the answers to all the questions and everything you do, isn't it, John? Indeed it is.
Good afternoon, everyone tuning in from Youth Space, LinkedIn, Twitter, or wherever you are across the world. I know we've got a lot of young people tuning in at the moment, and we've also got business leaders, maybe some politicians, which we'll get <laughs> on to in a minute. Indeed. We've topped up, or well, we've not topped up our tea, but we've got some interesting mugs. I've got a, a smiley face, and John's also got a... Vaguely smiley. A, a vaguely smiley. Vaguely smiley face. Vaguely we'll, smiley. we'll take it. We'll take it. So, John, I want to... I want to turn a little bit around. I, I, I've seen your LinkedIn profile and, and the team put it together for me. And I just like, and last night, 21 hours ago, or it would have been 23 now, you did something around culture in the press. So yet again, doing your own work. I was like, okay, I've done that. Tick that box. What is your invisible success? What's something that I can't find online that you believe has made you successful in your career? So uh, I think it's the conversation we've been having, really. So when you, you mentioned culture, so I, I can tell the story around, there's a strategic framework around what we're doing at Lloyd's. Where did that come from? My, my learning of the conversation we're having, today, it's not me, I'm not the clever one. So I thought, I'm taking on a different job. I'm going to go and ask everybody what they want me to do. So that's what I did. So even at the age in your 50s, I'm still going around asking people in the US, asking people in Europe, asking people in London, what do you want me to do? So the strategy that we're deploying, which includes culture and purpose, was because that's what people told me they wanted me to do. So they said, when you go to Lloyd's, do three things. Sort out performance, because actually businesses have to be successful for everybody, not just for your investors, but for your customers. Sort out performance, address the cost of doing business, because we want to be able to sell more products to more customers, tick, show some leadership. Those were the three things I was told. So the strategy that we're deploying is a direct response to the three things that people ask me to do. So none of us are super, well, I don't think any of us are super clever. I'm sure not super clever. So do the right thing and go and ask lots of people what they think you should do and use that to inform your thinking and your strategy. So, so I learned that early on and I still do it the same way. You know, so if you've listened to people and you've interpreted what they want you to do and that's what you're doing, hugely powerful. So you, your third one, I want to I wanna tap on that, show leadership. Yeah. What do, you, what do you believe makes a good leader? We've had a few leaders that have uh, lasted 40, 44 days <laughs> and so <laughs> at the moment. What shows, what shows good leadership? So, so I think t two things... Two things really matter. So, so I think in business, two things. You know, you, you go through, but we all, we're all in business, aren't we? These, these are the 100,000 things we need to do. Number one, I think you need a, a good strategy. We were just talking about that a moment ago. So people need to think, yeah, that makes sense. I can do that. Number two, you need to care. If you get those two things right, if the people you work with really believe that you care, and they also think, I can see what we're trying to do and relate to that, everything else will fall into place. So if you wanted one word, what, what defines really good leadership? Authenticity is the word that matters to me. Is that a real person? Is it the real person you're seeing turn up at work? And of course, some people are, some people aren't. And where you were going a little bit with lead, so the two things that worry me at the moment is the world needs leadership. And it's the one thing we're struggling to get. We don't have one. the leadership right now. We don't, the US don't, the Germans don't, the French, don't. I mean, it worries me. So, so the world craves leadership, number one. And number two, you know, planning is long term. It's not short term. I mean, yes, there are things you need to do quite quickly because problems present themselves, but you've got to have a long term plan. It can't all be fed by, you know, what you think the newspapers are going to say tomorrow. Or the day. That can't be the answer. So those are the two things I think we're struggling with at the moment. Have we got the best leaders doing the right things for us? And have we got long term thinking? And I don't think we've got either. And I don't just mean the UK. I think those are global challenges. So also when I look at the Lloyd's building, yeah. when I don't think that it's men in black, I think or it's a like a... coffee pot. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's like a lab. <laughs> yes. So if we were to create a, a leader that the world needs right now, what would, what would they be saying and what would they be doing? So, so I think you've got... You've got some very obvious challenges, haven't you? So let, let's pick, you know, let's pick two topics that we're talking about. I, th I think leaders today, we've got a responsibility to create the right environment for the next generation of talent that will be better than us to come through. So, so if we don't put the concentration 
into who's next and trust who's next early on. That's one of my biggest fears. I, I get up sometimes in the morning and think, would the 57-year-old John Neal give the 25-year-old John Neal a chance? And I've got to be able to answer that question as yes. Because it's the 25-year-old John Neal that the world needs, not the 57-year-old John Neal. So we've got to give talent a chance would be one thing we've got leaders to do. So give that generation a chance for, for goodness sake, number one. And number two, let's be honest about some of the big challenges that we've got to deal with and be determined to deal with them. So, you know, when everyone talks about climate and transition, if we really believe that's a challenge, well, let's get on and address it. Because actually in addressing it, we'll create lots of opportunity, lots of new bright ideas, and lots of new jobs, lots of challenges for the next generation to come through and do what they need to do. But the macro one for me would be the point I was making a minute ago. 57-year-old John Neal's got to give the 25-year-old John Neal a chance. Otherwise, and, there's no future. And how do you get into that mindset? You use the word which I respect, care. Yeah. And we, we, we can't expect everyone to care from day one. Yeah. But how do you get into that framework? framework? So the CEOs who are listening from LinkedIn right now, yeah. and they go, oh, you know what? I need to give that young talent a chance. How can they make it authentic, like you said, so, and care? Yeah, what, do so we, I, what do we need them to do? So I think different levels. I, I don't think it needs to be ridiculously complicated. So, so care can be quite complex and sophisticated. So, you know, for example, in September, uh, we paid all of our staff who were earning less than the best paid a one-off payment. Why? Because everyone's staring into a really tricky winter and they're gonna need help for food, they're gonna need help for energy. So, so that's care at one level. Care at a basic level is when you rock up at work on a Monday morning, as you walk past someone's desk, just ask them if they had a good weekend. What did they do? So care works on so many different levels mm -hmm. and just a conversation and interest in that person is caring. You know, if you're the boss or a leader, just walking past everyone's desk is not caring. So just make that walk five or six minutes, not 30 seconds, and just check in on people. So care can be that simple. It doesn't have to be a strategy. It can just be a conversation. And what is your message around climate? Because I know you're, you're, t you're taking a trip soon. Ah, uh, yes, 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 indeed. This weekend, yep. off to uh, Sharm El Sheikh. So what's your, what's, your, what's your message and mission when you're there? So I think it's simply this. So, so you, you know, and we feel very lucky, you know, we've been involved, as have many businesses and interests, with something called the Sustainable Markets Initiative, which was set up by the king, for goodness sake, um, who's been brave for a long time in sticking his head above the parapet and talking about climate and talking about transition. So, so... So, so our view on it is that it's an opportunity. You know, we have an obligation to secure the future of the planet. I think, I think and, and because of what we do for a living and we look at disaster, we know, we know there is a challenge. So, but the challenge isn't gonna happen in a nanosecond. So it is about transition. So you don't walk away from your responsibility to back energy companies. That is not the answer. What we've got to do is say, let's get behind the plan. What is the plan that gets us to net zero by 2050? So let's be satisfied there is one and then lean in and help people to get there. So, so I think it's an opportunity. It's like a decision. So when people say, right, OK, I'm going to improve performance and they go about it in a very diligent way, don't they? Or I've got to improve my technology. They go about it in a diligent way. It's the same, I think, if you're thinking climate or dare I say it, culture. If you're determined to be inclusive, it's just a decision. People say, oh, cultural is a generational, it's not a generational change. If you want to be inclusive, if you want to represent an inclusive and diverse workforce, make your mind up that's what you want to do and do it. So, so that's really where we're at as well. It's action oriented. Same with climate. Do you think we have a plan around the climate right now? No, I think we've got to be braver. <laughs> You know, so, so people turn around, and you can look at numbers in two different ways, can't you? So everyone turns around and says, my God, it's going to cost three to four trillion a year between now and 2050. The world's GDP is 100 trillion. So it's three to four percent of the world's GDP. If we want to set the planet, planet up for long-term future success, I think it's an easy decision. The answer is, yes, let's do it. If we do it, then out of that comes a lot of activ activity, a lot of interest, a lot of jobs, a lot of opportunity. So I think it's an easy decision. And what can young people do to play their part right now? What, could, what, cha what one change they could do right now 
over this next week and then continue. Cause, oh, cause I, it's... I, I think the, re- the, reason, the reason that we're talking about climate and, you know, as insurers, I remember writing papers on climate in the 80s, but, you know, but, but no one really thought about is because of what the young people are saying. Because, and I think it does matter, because we've got the next generation talking about climate, profiling climate, you know, really pushing business and pushing leaders hard, it's found a voice. So, so keep making a fuss. Keep making a fuss. We've got a new prime minister. We have. Again. Yep, often, often, most <laughs> often, days, often. most days. And we both know Rishi. We do. What is your advice? in terms of Rishi and the Prime Minister, what does he, what's the three things you believe, what, what's the three things you would do if you was Prime Minister today? What do we need to do? So, so, so num- number one, you know, um, I've no had- No U-turns. Some, I've had some, oh God. <laughs> the, the, I, so I've had some dealings with him and I've always been impressed by the way in which he's conducted himself, both in the moment and after the moment. So, so he, he knows that we've got to make change and we've got to set ourselves up for long-term success. So you get that sense in dealing with him. I think that the big challenge that he's got is, is twofold, if you think about it. 40% of the UK's GDP is under the control of the government. It costs £1.1 trillion a year to run the government. Now, I'm not saying that number's right or wrong, but it's a lot of money. So he's got to ensure that we're delivering value for that money. So, so should we be investing in the NHS? Yes, it's 195 billion a year. Are we getting the right value for it? Are we investing enough in education? Probably not. So how do we get the, the money going in the right direction and how do we ensure we get best value out of it? So he's got that issue to think about and I think he's very conscious of that, number one. And number two, the legacy of the complicated world we found ourselves in has created a lot of debt. So he's got to find a way that economically we can grow and he's got a way of repaying that debt. So we owe more, we owe more than our GDP. Debt's now just over three trillion pounds. So we've got to find a way of repaying that to release some of the burden. And he knows that. So how, how do I actually, it's not about more tax. How do I actually, or less tax. It's about how do I get value out of the money that's under my control. He's got to set the economy up longer term and he's got to find a way to promote and encourage growth. So whether it's your business or my business? How does he encourage me and you that we are right to invest, it's safe to invest, and growth is a good thing? Absolutely. And what can he do for young people? So, so I think what he's got to do for... So, so I, I think for, for young people, we've got to do two, two things, really. I, I think we've got to invest more in education at all levels. You know, you know when you think we spend, oh, we spend 67 billion a year on education. I, I think everything we put into, into educating young people, and educating is everything from apprenticeship through to formal education at university. So I think, I think we've got to put more money into education so people are better prepared. And then as people go into the workforce, he's got to promote and encourage people like me and you running businesses to have the confidence to invest in businesses so there are more opportunities for young people, so that there is more employment opportunity. And we also need sustainability because a bit like the Prime Minister, the Education Secretary, we've had Nadeem on with, yeah. I know, Gillian and it's, and met uh, Gavin last night. And uh, you, it's too much change yeah. too quickly. And you, you, you mentioned earlier about having a long-term plan. Yes, there are short, quick things that you need to change, but having a plan that people can get behind. And if leadership keeps changing... If the leadership kept changing in my job, in my company, every five minutes, teams are going to get confused, they're not going to know there's a new plan. There needs to be some sustainability. Bit, a bit Agree. at the moment, like what's going on over at Twitter, uh, there's yeah, chaos. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. you have to laugh because I do like Elon. I bring in a sink he's, in. He's, to, different. Into, he's different, isn't he's he? He's different. He's different. But change can change is good if you can get everyone on board and I understand it but too much change can cause chaos yeah I, I agree so I, th- I think you've got to have a plan so you know we've been talking a little bit about it with with our time at Lloyd's and our value in insurance so we've got four strategic objectives they're not going to change performance digitalization which is about better technology purpose why are we here culture are we doing the right things by and for our people 
So, so if we're sat here chatting in five years' time, I promise you, it'll be performance, digitalization, purpose, culture. They're the right things to be doing. So don't change them. Just make sure that you're fresh in the way in which you think about each of those objectives. And then from a leadership point of view, the advantage we have, I think, in business is we can be a bit more thoughtful about the way in which we develop leaders. So it doesn't, it's not happen chance. You've got the right people, the right progress, and that progress is happening over time. You know, I, I sort of worry a little bit, this is just a John Neal view. Is the concept of government in the 21st century fit for purpose? You know, this concept of 51% of the population say yes, therefore yes is the right answer. I don't think the world's like that anymore. If 49% have said no, that can't be the right answer because you've got a very substantial minority who are saying no. So I, I think the whole thesis of government needs some deep thinking. I genuinely think that needs some deep thinking because it's not quite, it's not working for them and it's not quite working for us. So, so we need to scratch our heads and say, this concept of government that was designed in 1600 and whatever, does it need, does it need some different thinking about how a best government can set itself up for success? Because boy, do we need it. We need leadership at that level really badly. Or maybe they should adopt your plan and ask people. Yeah. And then deliver what the people say. Not, not a bad idea, yeah. is it? Not a bad idea. Not a bad idea. I'm a, I'm a big believer that life is all about long life learning. Mm. And you can go into every room, be inspired, be uninspired, learn, unlearn. What's something you learned in the last 30 days that you didn't know 30 days ago? Oh, geez, 30 days. Um, probably the most... Yeah, you know, unusual thing that's happened to me in 30 days. So I was, I was uh, uh, down having a few days off with the family in Portugal and um, because of our sustainable markets initiative was told that the king wanted to have a conversation with me. So that was quite a learning because you think, well, there is only one answer to that request, isn't it? And the, re and the answer is yes, of course I'll go there. And it's exactly the thought process that we've gone through here. If I'm going to sit in front of the king, one of the most important people in the country, if not the most, what am I going to say to him? You know, what, what might he ask me and what might I ask him? So, so it was reminding me of part of the conversation that we've just had about being prepared for the conversation you want to have. And you get to ask me the question, so what did I want him to do? What I wanted him to do was to continue to represent what I think he's represented really well. You know, when, when you hear him speak, he cares about the planet, he cares about people, he cares about health. So the message is, we need someone of your stature and your standing and your voice to keep talking about those subjects because they're really important. And what was his response? He, he wants to. No two ways about it. He sees, I think, as we all know, because we read about it and I read about it as well, he's trying to work out, isn't he, how to set the monarchy up for success. And I think it's got to be slightly different. And I think we all feel a little bit, having seen what we've seen, yeah. we all feel a sense of pride and a sense of belief in what role he can perform. So, so I think it's giving him the confidence that we do believe in him and we do believe the, in the voice he has on certain subjects. And that was the message. That leads me really in nicely to talk about compromising and not always having the perfect opportunity. Yeah, yeah. What is your advice to young people compromising so they might need, they might see this job that they want to do and they want to get into insurance, they want to get into the city, but they, the job requires them to be in the city three days a week, mm. but they can't have three days a week in the office and then work full time remote. So how does, how, t talk us a little bit about compromising and meeting employers in the middle and kind of meeting things in the middle and opportunity in the middle. Yeah, so, so I, think, I, I think the whole concept around what does work mean is up for debate. And I, and I think get involved in the conversation. So, so I passionately believe in flexibility at work. And I'll give you the quick reason why. You know, it was my time in Australia was so so we, you know we're, we're running an insurance business so we have to do quarterly reporting boringly all the numbers come in if you live in australia as you know from your time in new zealand you're first up and first to bed in the world so i say we were at quarter numbers i need them in on friday you go home on friday feeling pretty good about yourself by saturday all hell's broken loose because the uk sent everything in the us sent everything in. it's a mess so what we did was we changed our weekends on quarter days said look 
actually, if we're in Australia waiting for it, we'll take the weekend Thursday, Friday. We'll start work and we'll come to work on Saturday because we know everything will have hit us on Saturday. We'll work Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then take Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday off. So four out of nine days, no one's going to interrupt us. No emails, no phone calls. And actually, you've got a different weekend. You can do different things. So for me, that's what businesses have got to do is have the conversation with their people to say, we've all got to get stuff done. The What's the best way to do it? And it's going to be different for different people. So there's no rule. You need to come to work three days a week. That can't, that can't be the answer. What works for your business? And it's going to be different. If you do that and the young people get involved in that conversation and be part of the solution because you'll enjoy it, you'll feel better about it and your employer will be dead chuffed because they'll think, great, that's been really helpful. I've got two more questions, John. Go for it. What's your message to young people across the country right now? So I, I think... Be optimistic about yourself and who you are. You know, the world's a pretty uncertain and tricky place, but don't feel that about yourself because we need you, because we need your brain power, your energy, your because I, I haven't got the energy that you've got, so we need you. So feel confident, feel confident in representing who you are because we want you and we need you. Wow, and my final question, it's what's your duvet flip? What gets you out of bed in the morning? So, the duvet? so what gets me out of bed is a bit of the conversation we're having. So it's that desire to leave people feeling confident. So, so, so that's where I feel I have a responsibility. So as an insurer, what I do as a day job is hopefully give businesses and the government confidence to make big decisions because we've given them the right protection. And at an individual level, I want that as well. I want people that work for me to feel a able to express themselves and able to make a difference and feel that they're valued. Uh, and that's on the weekday and on the weekend it's Sydney the dog. Sydney the dog, the lab. So like most dogs she tends to get up weekends the same time which is 6am. So wow. she wants to get up early because she wants start. to be fed. So priority one, feed the dog. Then the world's a calmer place. Well John on that note I just want to say thank you so much. Your wisdom, your honesty, your directness in terms of breaking it down to make it really simple. I just want to say thank you for your time today and sharing your wisdom. It's been really good fun, Jack. I've appreciated it. And there you have it, my duvet flip. A fantastic series about putting your hand up, getting involved with the conversation, having a voice, learning to compromise, never go into a meeting without a plan. And that's all time we have time for today. This You can watch this back. You can chop it up. You can write comments. Ch write into us. Follow John on LinkedIn. He's, he's on LinkedIn. He's got a fantastic <laughs> profile on there. Check out the fantastic early careers on the Lloyds of London website. There's got fantastic careers from grad programs, summer internships to apprenticeships. Check them out because that could be a career for you. Thank you and see you next time. Good there stuff. you go.